Ladies and gentlemen, show your appreciation, please, for Dominic Morehouse. <laughs> I did ask for a military march on the way down here, but um, I was vetoed by, by Paul, unfortunately. Um, thanks for that fabulous, by the way, Paul. I don't think I, I've deserved that yet. Um, I'm going to spin you a yarn today. Uh, we call them dits in, in the forces. Uh, that soldiers like to tell dits. And I'll, uh, there's an element of that. There's a, there's a bit of a dit in, in this. But there is a rationale for it, so follow me on that journey. Twenty years ago, in the autumn of 2001, I was on board Her Majesty's ship Fearless, HMS Fearless, sitting off the coast of Turkey, preparing to transit through the Suez Canal. Uh, as an army major at the time, I was the brigade electrical and mechanical engineer, the BME, and we were on board the headquarters ship en route to Oman for Exercise Safe Surya 2, a large cooperative training exercise held every... 15 years or so, involving 1st Armoured Division stationed in Germany at the time. My brigade, 3 Commando Brigade, Royal Marines, was playing the enemy. Both sides had attached forces from, from the Omani army. The brigade headquarters that was on board ship uh, was training daily for the exercise, getting ourselves ready. And life was relatively relaxed, though sort of naturally focused. Then the Twin Towers and Building 7 were demolished. And as with every pivotal moment in history, when everyone can recall where they were, life changed forever. We carried on training for the exercise, but it was all now seen through a different lens. Suddenly, Royal Marines were patrolling the flight deck as we transited through this, the canal. And we started to consider the need for dual planning, for the impending exercise, of course, but we also started because three commando brigade, like the Paras, are in defense terms early responders to consider the possibility of a future operation in Afghanistan. It was already been mooted even then. Fast forward a few months to early 2002, and elements of the brigade were in Bagram, uh, not far from Kabul, working with the US 10th Mountain Division on Operation Jukana. I played my minor role, my main minor part in that op, but we were lucky in the early days. The conditions were relatively benign compared to how they later became in Helmand province and elsewhere. I'll return later to this, this Afghan, Afghan theme. Other tours, as a, as a regular and a reservist officer, saw me working in the Ministry of Defence and Abbey Wood in Bristol in equipment capability and procurement. I helped bring Challenger 2 into service, and that dates me, I'm afraid. But more recently and latterly, I was in capability again, this time in Army headquarters, for about three and a half years. That saw me through to retirement this year in May as a reservist lieutenant colonel, having served 35 years in all. So what have I learned in all that experience? So, so what have I learnt in all that experience that started during the Northern Ireland troubles of the mid-80s and before, the end of the Cold War, through the early 90s conflicts in former Yugoslavia, and the almost eternal Middle Eastern conflicts spanning over 30 years? If nothing else, we seem to have experienced almost unreal continuous warfare, which, if it was fictionalised, you wouldn't believe. I didn't join in 1984, it was actually a year later, but it might as well have been. For the UK military machine, warfare fought somewhere in the world has been a win-win-win, except it hasn't for all those physical victims who have been the losers, not forgetting the British taxpayer who has footed the bill throughout. Young men and women are attracted by the romanticism and patriotism of an honourable fight, as it is sold to them. Our elitist leaders are glorified by the power of military projection, 
and they and the ever-present military-industrial complex sit comfortably back at home, reaping the dividend, whilst they bloody the next generation of warriors. This has become the norm. We're now used to it. War is peace. Don't get the idea that I'm a peacenik, though, or a CND supporter. I'm not, and I never have been. But if reform is urgently required in the UK defence world, and it is, then we need to move away from generational plans that appear to hop from one conflict to another for no apparent reason. resulting in yet more veterans and their families suffering a life of hardship and pain and an even and an ever increasing defense caused debt burden where money could and should be spent elsewhere the united kingdom rightly holds our outstanding army armed forces in very high regard and the military in turn pride themselves on their effectiveness and adaptability change is a constant part of military life but on closer inspection it all occurs around the same paradigm that feeds off itself and pats itself on the back too often for the illusion of direction, efficiency, and good leadership. Whereas in reality, it has become very, very expensive. It is now too engrossed in civil service-driven cultural Marxist wokery and too beholden to the... and too beholden to the military-industrial complex of Eisenhower's prophecy. The chief of the defence staff rightly warns about the Chinese Communist Party threat, whilst overseeing on his watch the introduction of rampant communist intersectionalism via the back door. The chief of the general staff speaks to a good future effective fighting force, whilst constraining military hands through the imposition of green energy policies that are anathema to heavy vehicle movement, which he appears little to understand, merely, merely to virtue signal to the diktats of a nonsensical UK government green policy that is solely and secretly simply another form of tax on an already overburdened public. Whilst the recent Brexit-led UK consensus should be taking us away from forming a monolithic joint EU defence force, MOD signals appear to be moving us back towards it. The military have been growing their intelligence capability, but what and whom are they surveilling? There's evidence of it being turned inwards and this ever, in this ever-constraining big brother environment in which we now live. And if we're not surveilling our own, there appears to be tacit five eyes consent to surveil other countries' citizens, which they provide our governmental intelligence organisations with, with intel on us. That is fundamentally and morally wrong. <laughs> JFK reminded us that the very word secrecy is repugnant to us in a free and open society. Defence needs to mirror that message with openness and transparency. We should avoid the Chatham House norm and the prideful application of its secret rules. They are anathema to us. 20 years after 9-11, and the UK military death toll from Afghanistan alone stands at 457. But that bleak statistic obscures many things. An in-country similarly high civilian death toll and the enormous numbers of wounded personnel and their families, suffering physical and psychological torment ever since. It seems ironic, looking back over the years, that opium production increased over the period of our assistance, which previously the Taliban had sought, where previously the Taliban had sought to return the area to its ancient favoured breadbasket status of old. History as reported or as falsified is strange in, indeed in hindsight. The torment of suffering was highlighted recently by the travesty was that, that was Biden's withdrawal and the appearance of its utter incompetence. Spin it how you like, but it exposed the ineffectual nature of the UK government's 
supposed close relationship with the US? How is it possible, you might ask, that the UK military could be so caught short by the complete reversal of the original withdrawal plan that had been the subject of detailed preparation under the previous US administration? Military serving and retired friends of mine with more recent experience of the GAN have spent many wearisome hours in contact with their Afghan colleagues, interpreters and the like, trying to seek mechanisms for their safe rescue, a task that appeared so lacking in the UK Foreign Office. Soldiers and officers in the UK have looked on in despair over the last month as the value of their personal blood, toil, tears and sweat exacted during numerous tours, as well as all the Afghan army training, has been rendered completely meaningless. You might be getting a slight impression of irritation in my offering today. I speak out not for me, but on behalf of our serving military who can't publicly voice their concerns, and our veterans and their families who are reticent to out of loyalty. Our veterans are suffering, suffering deeply at the moment. I survived my Afghan experience relatively unscathed. Spare a moment, though, for Henry John James. He survived three IEDs in August 2010, but lost a number of mates. He lost an arm in the process, the one he had previously used to hold the hand of a friend while he was dying. Over the last 10 years, he suffered badly from PTSD, reliving the memory of the explosions. His relationship suffered too, with his now ex fiance his friends and family. But he was strengthened by his developing relationship with an Afghan family and their two young daughters. <clears throat> Growing up, he hoped, in a country that Henry's legacy had helped, he thought, to rescue. The father of the family had been an interpreter and a scout, who had then received a letter informing him that he and his family didn't qualify to come to the UK. Speaking of his Afghan friend, Henry notes, he's left to face a future going backwards. See, that was our legacy, the glue that stopped me thinking of suicide. Henry completed his suicide on 29th of August this year. So think of him as you observe the current establishment from the Prime Minister, the Cabinet Office and the Ministry of Defence collectively patting themselves on the back, trying to persuade us with mind space behavioural psychology that they haven't been caught short and that the end of the Afghan experience is anything other than an unmitigated UK disaster, as well as a US one. We, as Reform UK, are in a fortunate position at the moment. We have a blank slate. We are a relatively new party at the dawn of a new age. And the world is changing before our very eyes. It seems darker at the moment and somewhat chaotic. But in that chaos is opportunity, which in the past has been utilised to constrain future society. Reform UK needs to offer an alternate path that returns to the people, their God-given, sovereign, individual identities. In defence terms... <laughs> in defence terms, that means small-D defence in cooperation with others, not finance, military, industrial, corporate-driven, large-D defence. Change of this kind won't happen overnight unless we will it. And amongst the elitist leaders, it will be resisted. But then they are our servants, not we theirs. They have forgotten that they are beholden to we the people. And we must tell them that, this is no, that we no longer consent to their plans. Let us put on our armour then and defend our freedom and our future. For future deliberations about future UK defence policy then, UK veterans give you tacit permission to think outside the box. Everything should be on the table for radical review. Let us not hold back. Let us not be subservient to an industry that in reality makes money out of the misery of other people's lives. But take care. Those, in, those involved in future defence policy making will get sucked into the lobbying powerhouse from which it is almost impossible to be extracted, especially when the usual incentives and constraints are applied. And we should ignore pleas that it is all too difficult or that we're, we've always done it like this. 
Whilst downscaling but retaining a small defence capability, we can do other things with our industrial base. That there is a world of high-tech ploughshares in which we can and should be focusing our energies, whilst defensively and not aggressively keeping our populace safe. This is why we need reform. This is why we need Reform UK. God bless you.